Today on this episode of The Brain Surgeon's Take, we will be discussing the Promising Pathway Act, fast-tracking brain tumor research with president of the Musella Brain Tumor Foundation, Dr. Al Musella. Learn about this much-needed proposed law for brain tumor patients as well as a learning system to track all patients who use these therapies. Much more on this podcast episode. Welcome back, everyone. Here's my take on Al Musella. He is someone who has taken life's tragedies and transformed them into positive change. Dr. Musella has lost multiple family members to brain cancer, and as a result, has devoted his time and energy to improving our care of these patients. Most notably, Dr. Musella founded the Musella Brain Tumor Foundation and created and ran the Brain Tumor Forum, which ultimately inspired the NCI to form clinicaltrials.gov which is one of the most important resources for all cancer patients. During this interview, we focused on a topic that is near and dear to my heart, accelerating the translation of brain cancer research into patient care. It currently takes an extraordinary amount of time for promising treatments to reach the clinical arena, which is both frustrating to patients and doctors like myself. However, Dr. Musella is looking to change all that with his proposed Promising Pathway Act, which will create a conditional approval pathway for certain cancer treatments, as well as a learning system to track all patients who use these conditionally approved treatments. This will be a game changer, no doubt, allowing us to accelerate progress and ultimately move faster towards a cure. Listen up as we discuss the Promising Pathway Act, fast-tracking brain tumor research. Check it out. Hey, Al, how are you? Great. How are you doing? Listen, thanks for joining us today. I am excited to talk about your brain tumor foundation that's been so impactful to so many patients. And more importantly, talking about your promising pathway act that's going to accelerate brain tumor research. And that's, that is really needed. So again, thanks for joining us. Very excited to talk to you about these exciting endeavors. Thanks for having me. I feel honored. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, tell us about your background. The way that you got involved with brain tumors uh, is obviously very near and dear to your heart. Yes. Um, I was a podiatrist in private practice, very happy, very busy. Uh, Things were going smoothly. And then in 1992, my wife's sister, Lana, was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. Uh, Things were very different back in 1992. That was the year Netscape was invented. So there was no internet resources. Um, There was no place to turn. Um, she was told by Sloan Kettering that her tumor was really bad. It came back right after surgery and it was growing fast. They said, there's no clinical trials that would take her because it was too big. Uh, there was no treatments they could offer her, go home and die. And they actually told her she would not make it to December. And she had four little kids at the time. It was heartbreaking. Um, I was a computer nerd at the time. So I got into CompuServe, which was all we had. And there was no cancer forum for brain tumors. So I created the first one. So I created the first online support group for brain tumors. And the first thing I did is I had um, all the members of the group survey their local hospitals to come up with a list of clinical trials. At the time, if you call the National Cancer Institute and asked about clinical trials, they had a list of only their sponsored trials, but not the drug company sponsored trials or the doctor initiated trials. And the technology was so bad, they actually had to mail you the list which took three weeks. They couldn't even fax it, <laughs> wow. which is insane. So we decided to create a better list. We surveyed every hospital, found all the treatment options, and I created them into a master database and I put it on the website. And that was the first online clinical trials resource. Uh, the NCI actually came to me and uh, we worked together and modeled clinicaltrials.gov off of my website. My contribution to that was having them require that all human research uh, be reported to clinicaltrials.gov. So we had everything in one place. It makes it so much more valuable. Imagine today without clinicaltrials.gov. Yeah. I mean, that's a centerpiece for, I would say, most patients. That's their main resource. And that all yeah. came from your initiative, which is which is remarkable. You know, even with all of this, um, you know, publicity in terms of your foundation and um, and the NCI, do you still believe that brain cancer is under-recognized? And if so, why? Uh, yes, luckily it's pretty rare. So most people 
never had to deal with a family member fighting a brain tumor. You can't imagine what it's like until you go through it. Every family deals with some type of cancer. You know, the horrors of every type of cancer is a horror. But brain cancer is like a special type of horror. <laughs> it has neurological problems to the mix. So the, the typical person that you talk to doesn't care when we uh, ask for help supporting bills or for funding. That's why it's underrecognized. Mm -hmm. and you just mentioned underfunded. So you believe it's underrecognized and underfunded. Why do you believe it is underfunded compared to, let's say, colon cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer? Well, actually, that's a tough question. We could always use more money, but I would say it's not really underfunded. A lot of the money, a lot of money goes into brain tumor research, but it's not being used wisely enough. I think we could use new technologies to increase the efficiency so we could do much more with the money we have. Um, I'll get more into this when we talk about the Promising Pathway Act, but a quick example. There's a clinical trial going on right now that's costing the company running at about a million dollars per patient. That's completely insane. There has to yeah. be a way to do this research cheaper and on a much larger scale. If it's costing a million dollars per patient, you're not doing that many patients. With brain tumors, you need as many patients as possible to do this research on. Otherwise, we're not – basically, the number of patients is um, – going to determine how much time it takes to find the cure. If we have a large number of patients, it's going to be a shorter time to the cure. It makes sense. But if it's a million dollars a patient, forget about it. We yeah, have to and, be efficient. And it's also a rare condition relative to breast or lung or colon cancer. So right. like you said, getting numbers is right. critical. And in order to get those numbers, it's got to be affordable. It's also got to be- And accessible. Emotion. Yeah, and accessible. Because and it's only about 5% be... of adults enter clinical trials for brain tumors. We need 100% of the people being followed in a virtual, uh, virtual trial. Why do you think so few patients go into clinical trials? Oh, that's easy. Uh, the first problem is geography. Um, I would say the majority of patients don't live within driving distance of a major center that's doing the trials. And then of the best trials, the ones that I really love, there's only a few centers doing those. So the chance of being close enough to one of those centers is, is tough. Then you have the problem of the entry criteria. Uh, the majority of patients don't hit that perfect little window. Like the better the trial, the, the narrower their eligibility criteria because they're trying to cherry pick the best patients, obviously. But the average patient doesn't qualify. Yeah. Um, the funny thing is, in the United States, the average survival for glioblastoma is only eight months. But of the last five major clinical trials, the control groups averaged 16 months, which means they're working on a different population than the average typical patient. Um, patients just can't get in. And then you have the problem of the number of spots. Like some of these very good trials have a limited, limited number of spots with a lot of patients trying to get into them. So for example, I don't want to mention which one is my favorite, but my favorite trial, uh, I would say I sent about 50 patients to it and like two got in, which is crazy. We need these things open to every single patient who wants them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We, we have the same problem here. You've got people that live too far away to come back for the clinical trial, and then the eligibility criteria are way too strict. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Musella Foundation and what your mission is. Okay. <clears throat> We're devoted to empowering brain tumor patients and their family. We provide emotional and financial support and help them navigate the system. We facilitate educational resources, we advocate for the patient's need, and strive to raise funds for groundbreaking brain tumor research. And together, we aim to make a difference in the lives of those affected by brain tumors and continue uh, contribute to the advancement of effective treatments. We have like three or four major programs. Let me just outline them briefly. First is funding. We fund brain tumor research. We like to fund early research on new ideas to allow the researchers to gather the data needed to get the big government grants. So it's like getting them started. We also fund access programs. We helped fund a few expanded access programs, and we offer a co-payment assistance program to help patients pay for the treatments. Uh, so far, we funded 193 research projects for over $6 million. Wow. And for the co-payment program, we gave out over $12.4 million in grants to help patients get access to treatments. That's like a life-saving program. Um, my dad and my sister-in-law both had trouble with uh, paying for drugs. My sister-in-law... She actually lived eight and a half years. We got her on an uh, off-label drug that she was doing fantastic on for about five years, and then her insurance hit its lifetime maximum, and they stopped paying for the drug. So she stopped taking it without telling me, of course. Otherwise, I would have tried to find a way to get it for her. And she had a recurrence and then died. 
and with my dad, he was diagnosed the same month that Timidog came out. When he went to get the prescription, it was so expensive. Just to give you a strange idea of what ha- what life was like in the 1990s, his drug plan had a $500 per year maximum. <laughs> you imagine that? And the Crazy. copay was and the copay was like $1,200, and he refused it. He said he didn't want. He had the money, but he didn't want to leave my mother penniless. So he was concerned about money at that time. He knew he would never work again. So because both of them had trouble with paying for drugs, that's why I started the copayment program. And so most of the patients that we talked to, they won't get their Timidar if we didn't if they didn't have a program like this. And we're the only brain tumor organization that's allowed by law uh, to help Medicare patients because they have these kickback regulations and we got around it. Wow. That's a um, beautiful thing. Thanks for thanks for setting that up and what a great gift for those patients. Uh, I want to talk about your most well, exciting project. Oh, wait, wait. Let me, let me just finish. There's a couple more programs we have. Oh, sure. No problem. So we have uh, advocacy. I was involved a lot in a lot of the private and public FDA Medicare meetings over the years, uh, helping to get most of the treatments that we have now approved by both Medicare and the FDA. I'm on the Patient Advocacy Board of the Brain Tumor Center at Duke, the Brain Tumor Sport Program at UCLA, and the Northwell Health Brain Tumor Program, as well as I, I advise many drug and device companies on uh, patients' perspectives for the clinical trial design. Uh, we help pass many bills, such as the Right to Try and the one that I'm working on, Promising Pathway. Then we have an educational program. We provide educational materials. I wrote a book called The Brain Tumor Guide for the Newly Diagnosed. Anybody listening can get free copies for their waiting room if they like. Just go to our website and you could read a copy, evaluate it, and if you like it, ask for free copies. Um, we have a news blast that helps keep pe- uh, patients up on the latest news. And then our most important program is we have a patient navigation program. We collaborate with Cancer Commons and x to run a unique patient navigation program, which we actually run as a clinical trial, which is called a patient-centric platform trial for precision oncology. It's listed on clinicaltrials.gov. Basically, a patient comes to us, we gather and organize all their medical records into our registry, and our AI system helps identify what we call plan options that might be best for the patients. We use the ongoing results of the patients in the registry, virtual tumor boards on similar patients, expert opinions, and we're working on adding all the medical literature to help prioritize the options. Uh, the plan option could be like a clinical trial, or expanded access, right to try, an off-label treatment, and combinations of any of these. Um, oh, that's impressive. It's a, yeah. it's a massive amount of work. Jeez. All right. And then the results are reviewed and curated by our PhD navigators. We give the report to the patient and the doctor, which lists all these options, as well as the rationale for why we think it might help. And then the patient and the doctor decides which ones they want to try, or they could select anything else that's not on the list. You know, we're, you know, we're open to anything. And then we try to help the patients get access to it. And then no matter what they try, we follow up to see how it works out. And the system learns from every single patient and uses that information to reorder the options for future patients. Um, we're trying to prove that our system works in, the, in that clinical trial by comparing the patients uh, that we take in who follow our suggestions versus those who don't follow our suggestions to see if we make a difference. Wow. I would say that you really hit the nail on the head when you're talking about brain tumors for the newly diagnosed in that book and guiding these patients. I would say most of these patients have no idea where to turn to, right? It's such an overwhelming diagnosis. They have to make the biggest decision of their lives and they don't have the background information to do so. And most organizations won't even hint at which of two or three options might be best for them. Um, We always tell them, you know, here are the options, and this is why we like this one over this one. But, you know, any of these are reasonable options. And you always get whichever you can easily get over, like it's better to get a local treatment that might be mid-level versus the best one that's a thousand miles away where you, you might not even be able to get in. Yeah. So I think just having that guidance, uh, you know, people who have to make, like you said, it's the most important decision of their life. It's critically time sensitive and you don't have resources. So thanks again for doing that. And I want to go back to what you mentioned earlier, the exciting Promising Pathway Act. Tell us a little bit about that act and where it currently is in the process of getting approved. Okay. This is going to be the highlight of my career if it's passed. I believe it has a great chance of speeding up the search for the cure so we see a cure in my lifetime. Without it, there's no hope of me seeing the cure. And I'm getting old, so I don't have that much time left. And I want to get this done. It's been so frustrating seeing this slow progress over the last 30 years. 
uh, the, PP, the Primary Circuit Pathway Act creates a new conditional approval pathway where after a phase two trial that shows relative safety and a hint of efficacy, it gets conditionally approved. Basically, the bar is if the treatment is good enough where they would have been allowed to go into a phase three trial, it's good enough to get into this pathway. Once approved, any doctor can prescribe it for their patients, although off-label use is not allowed, and insurance should cover it. Uh, patients have to undergo informed consent that they understand the treatment did not get full FDA approval yet and agree to hold the doctor and the drug company harmless if they're problems. The risk to the patient is the same as if they're entering a phase three trial, although without the risk of getting a placebo. And I've never had a patient say they were worried about entering a phase three trial because of the risk of the drug. If it's a choice between dying or taking a shot, they always take the shot. Now, of course, this, this pathway is only for very serious diseases with no effective treatments. So all patients who use these treatments, this is the brilliant part of the plan. Uh, <laughs> all patients who use the treatment approved on the pathway have to consent to participate in a virtual trial registry. Ideally, we would use something like our learning system to track these patients. Our learning system is set up right now where it can handle this if the fact was approved today. Uh, patients will have access to their own medical records and the doctors and the researchers will have access to live de-identified data so they can determine which treatments are doing well and which ones are worth trying, which ones are not worth trying, and which combinations are being used and how they're doing. Just because a drug gets conditional approval it doesn't mean people are going to use it. If it doesn't have enough evidence, very few people are going to use it. Uh, only ones who are desperate will use it. And then once we build up enough proof that it helps them, then other doctors will start using it more broadly. We're planning that you got to have a, a lot of drugs to choose from. So you're not going to be forced into using the same drug just because you have a drug. Like People use Timidor all the time, even on MGMT on methylated patients, because there's nothing better. But we want to have options. Uh, the conditional approval is good for up to eight years, during which time the drug company has to prove the treatment is worthy of full approval. The final bar for full approval is actually the same level as the current pathway, uh, although it allows the use of real world, real world evidence instead of traditional phase three trials. They'll be allowed to pre-specify the type of patients they want to be counted in the virtual trial. For example, they can say, we want this treatment judged only on glioblastoma patients who meet the standard phase three trial criteria, such as Konofsky score, tumor size, number, previous treatments, and even biomarkers. This way, when patients who are in too bad a shape or do not have the right biomarkers don't respond, they're not counted against the treatment, but they're still able to get the treatment if they want it. Uh, they would be compared to matched external controls taken from the registry. If you can't prove the treatment's worthy within eight years, they remove the approval and no more patients can start the drug, but those already on it can't continue if the drug company is going to give the drug out. The drug company would have to go back to the traditional pathways if they want to try again. Every two years, the FDA reviews the data, and they can remove a conditional approval if the ongoing results show the treatment is not good. Um, I look at it as a better way of doing research, and the virtual trial basically replaces the phase three trial. I hate to say this, but I hate phase three trials. <laughs> I don't think it can really perform a valid and ethical phase three trial anymore. Um, first of all, the patients are so highly selected that they don't even represent the typical patient, as I mentioned before. Um, but the important thing is um, when people are dealing with a serious disease like a brain tumor and they have access to the internet and they're relatively smart and they see all these different options, they're not happy just doing what's in the clinical trial. Um, I don't want to mention exact drug names, of course, people are going to get into trouble. But there's one example that's horrendous when I think about it. Uh, there's a group of patients with a small type of tumor. I don't even want to mention the tumor type. Uh, where about 200 patients in the United States are taking an illegal copy of an experimental drug that's being obtained from Europe. These one to 200 people are also in clinical trials of other experimental treatments. This represents the majority of people in these clinical trials. They're not telling their doctors that they're taking this other experimental treatment, which has been proven mm. to double survival. So it completely invalidates every clinical trial for this type of tumor. It's wow. like insane. The promising pathway fixes that problem because um, once a drug gets conditional approval, you're allowed to use it in any combination you want. So there's no need for the patient to not tell their doctor what they're doing. We did a survey and we showed that the majority of patients do take other treatments in addition to the experimental drug when they're in a phase three trial. Some of it might be something like CBD oil, which is like 60 or 70% of the patients take. 
And nobody knows how that works on its own or in combinations. Plus, they're taking other supplements and they're taking other off-label drugs. And in the clinical, in the phase three clinical trial, you don't analyze the interactions of these drugs. You just look as if they're all homogenous and just taking that one drug, which is not true yeah. anymore. So I don't really like phase three trials, and this is a better way of doing a phase three trial. Um, now give us a little finish. background. Oh, okay. Right. Um, the one drawback <clears throat> is the accuracy of the data that we get. Um, the FDA mentioned that they don't like EMR data to be used because it's not um, really accurate, <laughs> so to say. The way that we're trying to fix that, first of all, I just, as I mentioned, the phase three trial is not accurate either. That data is completely wrong. They don't even list which drugs the patient is taking, which is mind blowing. Um, but what we're trying to do is we automatically collect the EMR data. We do it automatically. The doctor doesn't have to do anything other than chart the patient as normal. Our system collects all this data and organizes it, puts it into a database. Um, and we get the data from every single provider that the patient sees, including all the labs, all the uh, imaging. And we could cross check it against each other. So you could, for major things, you could see when there's a problem and then you could investigate that problem and find out why one patient is saying, one doctor is saying they have a glioblastoma, one other is saying something else. You have the pathology report to cross check it with. <clears throat> Then we also plan on having uh, the patients verify the data. We'll, the patients will fill out a survey like once a month with uh, patient reported outcomes. But we'll also tell them, look at this data in your portal and tell us if you see anything wrong. So you'll have a couple of checks and balances there. And also with the doctors knowing that we're taking their EMR data, I think they have more of an incentive to chart correctly. Because if somebody's looking over your shoulder, you don't want to be found in a lie, basically. Um, so I think that that problem, I think we could have better data than a phase three trial. Uh, we're working on version two of uh, 2.0 of the PPA to fix some of the problems that people have had with it. And it's going to be introduced in the next two weeks or so. We have enough senators where I think it's going to pass the Senate. We have problems with the House because the House is a mess and they're fighting on so many other things, they don't have time to do work. So we're going to need help pushing that. We have about 100 other organizations on our side helping to support this bill. Uh, there are a couple of organizations against the bill. Uh, I don't want to even mention who they are, but it's strange reasons that I don't even want to get into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, How far along are you guys, like, in terms of what's your if what's your ETA, you think, realistically to get approved? We're working with Senator Braun from Indiana. He's the main person. There's a lot of other senators involved, too. Uh, he's not running for re-election, so his last day in office is going to be in January of next year. He says he wants this to be his legacy. He wants to pass before January, and he okay. thinks he could do it. That would be amazing. Yeah, that would be amazing. Can, just, just give us a little background. I mean, you and I know why research is so delayed, but just as background for our listeners, I mean, the current timetable for a new brain cancer therapy to reach patients can be over a decade currently. Why is the FDA process so incredibly delayed? Okay. First of all, it's a 100-year-old system that needs to be updated. Um, there was a recent drug application that I was involved in where the application itself was a million pages long. That's insane. How could anybody evaluate a million pages? It would take me 20 years to read that. And by the time I got to the end, I wouldn't remember the first 15 years of it. Exactly. There's too much overlap, too much. You don't need that type of data. And that, that was my point with the Promising Pathway Act. We don't have to collect all the, like, the, the amount of data we get on each patient is incredible. There's, there's 5,000 pages of data on every patient, but most of it is meaningless. So we're using artificial intelligence to crunch that into the important things. So you just identify the anomalies. Like you don't want to see 500 times that their blood sugar was within the normal range. You want to see the blood sugar was in the normal range for the last 10 years, except for these dates, you know, so to summarize everything. And you can use artificial intelligence for that. You just have to upgrade the concepts involved. It, it's just too bulky. Um, if you have a million pages, how you can't evaluate that in a year. It's like insane. Yeah. So we just have to change the system, summarize the data uh, with links to, you know, the details if they need them. Um, and I can understand that process being used for a drug used by millions of people for something relatively minor like high blood pressure. 
But for somebody dealing with a brain tumor where you're going to die if you don't have this drug, it makes no sense to delay like that. Yeah. Would you agree? PPA. Would you agree with the statement? And I've heard this before, and I, I tend to agree, but the FDA approval protocol, which is designed to protect patients, actually may be harming many of them. Yes. The system actually works great when the drug works really well. Like Gleevec, for example, it had a 95% response rate, and it got a really quick approval. The FDA did fantastic with that. <clears throat> the problem that we have is the cure for brain tumor most likely is not going to be one single drug. It's going to be a combination of drugs. And the system is not set up to approve parts of a combination without fully testing the whole combination, which is impossible because you don't know what the combination is until you start experimenting. You can't experiment until it's approved. So it's like a catch-22. Um, so the current system is not set up in the right way to find these uh, combinations. Something like the Promising Pathway Act could fix that problem and let all you guys, you know, your profession is like the most brilliant people on the planet. <laughs> and they all have great ideas, but most of the time, if you have a great idea, you can't implement it because you don't have the resources to do it. And it would take you a year to set up a trial, another two or three years to get the results, and then do an iteration. Whereas under the Promising Pathway Act, you could say, I think A, B, and C would be a good combination. Let's try that. You could even have a few of your friends try it. We record the results, and it's like setting up a trial instantly with no cost to you. Oh, and great. you're free to actually change it. So like if the patients start to recur, you figure out why they're recurring, and you add another drug to counter out that, where you can't do that in a clinical trial because it, it's a rigid protocol. What would you say if you could make one change in the FDA, what would it be? Okay. Uh, well, maybe two. Okay, uh, sure. <laughs> sure. It's the attitude. I've been in a lot of Medicare meetings with drug companies. And when you're sitting across the table from these people, there's like an adversarial attitude where the FDA seems to think that the drug companies are just trying to scam patients. And it's the FDA's job to stop them. So I think the biggest problem is an attitude adjustment. They're fantastic with us. They love patient advocates, and they treat me very, very, very nicely. But the way they even just talk to the drug companies is terrible. Um, so one thing I would change is just the attitude problem. The second thing, um, this is like a little technical, but I've been in a lot of these meetings. And what will happen is at the first meeting before you do a clinical trial, you present the uh, the trial design and the analysis plan, the data analysis plan to the FDA. They don't really say, yes, we approve it. They basically say, we don't object to it, which is not really the same thing. But once they don't object to it, you're allowed to use it. So you use it, you go five to 10 years, spend tens of millions of dollars, then you go to the ODAC meeting. At the ODAC meeting, the FDA rips it apart and says it's completely wrong and you can't do it that way. That's happened at every single ODAC meeting I've been to the century where they rip apart the trial that they approved five to 10 years before. One change I would make is when you give the plan to the FDA, when they sign off on it, they can no longer rip it apart. Um, there's a whole bunch of examples, but I think we're running low on time. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes total sense. What would you say is your single biggest barrier remaining in getting your Promising Pathway Act approved? Um, there's some financial barriers to changing the entire system. Um, you know, some people might make less money or some hospitals might make less money because we're going to de-emphasize phase three trials. We don't get rid of them. People are still going to run phase three trials, but it's not going to be required to get an approval from the FDA. Um, and there's a lot of money, like I said, a million dollars per patient for a, a trial, you're going to lose that. So some organizations have an opposition to this and they're actively fighting against it. They're petitioning the senators to not pass the bill. If we didn't have that opposition, it would be simple. Yeah, makes sense. At the end of the day, money always is a factor in all these decisions, unfortunately. With us, um, it's a patient first and we don't care about those changes. Um, like we have some sponsors of our organization. Usually, like the bigger drug companies might get hurt a little bit, but the small drug companies love this mm -hmm. uh, because they could cut it in half the amount of time it takes and they cut 90% of the cost out of developing a drug and they get 
to be able to charge very quickly. And the drug has to be paid for. Uh, like with Optune, after it was approved, it took eight years before Medicare paid for it. Now it'll be paid for immediately, basically. How do we compare with other countries? You know, the U.S., we're, we're only talking about the U.S. FDA here, but give our listeners a little background. Do you know how the FDA type industry works in other countries? Is it equally as stringent? Um, well, go back to the concept of conditional approval. Right now, I think it's Japan, Australia, the European, the European Union, and even Canada have some form of conditional approvals where if something looks good, patients can really use it quickly. Um, Japan has a nice treatment now that's been under conditional approval that seems to be doing pretty well. Um, the European Union actually approved a few different treatments. Um, but the one thing that they don't have is that registry where they're not tracking the patients. I think it's absolutely imperative that you track the patients who use these experimental drugs early. Otherwise, you can't tell how, well, how good they're doing and it doesn't really help people. Uh, the data is the key. It's the learning system that's going to make this work, not just getting early access. So once, if the uh, promising pathway gets approved, we'll be number one and we'll be the best system in the world and other people are going to start using the same model. But for right now, we're behind these other countries. That's so exciting to hear about what this what this act could possibly bring us. Uh, you know, give us your crystal ball view. We're only talking about your promising pathway act, but where do you see the FDA in general one decade, two decades from now, do you think it's going to be in general easier to get promising therapies through? Is your act going to have downstream effects? Um, well, I think, you know, aside from the PPA, um, in 10 years, I think approvals are going to be based more on biomarkers than tumor types. Um, because the more we learn, the more we see that specific biomarkers predict whether a drug is going to work better than telling you what exactly tumor type is like saying glioblastoma glioblastoma is really like a hundred different diseases combined even within the same patient Correct. so you're going to say this drug is approved for people who have like mutations of this pathway instead of whether it's a glioblastoma or a pneumoma or even a pancreatic tumor so that's going to be the big change i think well listen al what an amazing career you've had and it's still ongoing Kudos for taking an incredibly negative life experience and turning it into a very positive experience for so many patients. Um, amazing job with the Promising Pathway Act. Couldn't agree more with you in the sense that what we need are treatments quickly. Uh, I understand the FDA's rule and you know role in terms of like protecting patients, but at the same point, these patients don't have much time. They don't have years and years and years to go through trials. So. Again, amazing job, you, your entire organization, foundation, and look forward to having your act finally get approved. Could I just add one last comment? Of course. <clears throat> the biggest complaint we got from the FDA about the Promising Pathway Act is they think the doctors are not smart enough to interpret the data and figure out which treatments to use or not, that they need the FDA to tell them. I'm so insulted by that. I just can't believe it. But that's the, yeah. the way they think. Yeah, that is that is that is definitely insulting. Um, and like you said, I think they need a change in attitude uh, when it comes to us versus them, them versus drug companies. You know, we're all in this for the same reason, and that's to help patients. And I think that as long as the FDA plays nice and realizes that, as we talked about earlier, when you delay, the more you delay, you're actually causing more harm than good. And so I, I think there's a delicate balance and your group has definitely hit that delicate balance. And you also spoke about it best. Like you've got to track the data. There's no way That's to okay. know. That's yeah, you have no thing. idea to know what's working and what's not. You can't make any meaningful conclusions without data. So your entire- even without, Yeah, even without the Promising Pathway Act, that should be the future. We should agree to have all our patients in the central registry just to track everything else, even if we don't get Promising Pathway. We're trying to do that on our own and we're getting other organizations to help put patients into the system. So hopefully we'll have that one day. Yeah. It's all about big data. Listen, Al, thank you so much. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you too. Bye-bye.